We have uh, spent the last, a good portion of the last four or five months in the book of Ephesians, and we get to close that off today. In chapter 6, in verses 10 through 24. Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 24. And so here's how Paul closes the letter to the Ephesians. He says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly proclaim the mysteries of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak so that you also may know how I am how I am and what I am doing Tychicus the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord will tell you everything I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Father, as we come uh, to your word this morning, Lord, uh, we've been talking a lot about mission and and, and we've been out in in, in different places and we've got more to come. Uh, But Father, I pray as we come to your word this morning that you would open our hearts that we'd be able to receive, to hear from you. Lord, you know what each one of us needs to hear this morning, what each one of us, where you're working in each of our lives. And so I pray that you would speak to us from your word. Uh, It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Paul preached for us last week, the first half of chapter 6, and uh, he, he pointed out, if you notice, uh, I don't know if you see the, the, the title, but it says, we subtitled it, A New Way to Be Human, and he pointed out that we hadn't made very much about that, and I thought, you know what, you're right. Uh, there was a really good reason that, that we gave it that subtitle, A New Way to Be Human. Uh, it's, it's a song by one of my favorite bands. Uh, a band called Switchfoot. Um, but more than that, actually, uh, in Ephesians, Paul lays out what it means to be a new kind of human, a human who is alive, who is awake, who is walking by the Spirit, filled, full of the Spirit. It's a different kind of human, as opposed to, if you remember back in chapter 2, those who are dead in their trespasses, sins, in the, in the, in the sins in which we once walked following the course of this world. And so when we have Christ, when we are in Christ, filled with His Spirit, we have a new kind of humanity, if you will. And so in the first half of Ephesians chapters 1 through 3, Paul fleshes out how the, the foundation for this new, kind, new way to be human, the, what, all the blessings that we've received in salvation, and then where we've been since uh, the, the end of May when we got back from the States in chapters 4, 5, and 6 are the practical stuff. What does it look like to be a new kind of human I- I- in the world? What does it look like to be a new kind of human in a new community, the church? What does it look like to be a new kind of human filled with the Spirit in terms of the family and parenting and work? 
And he fleshes all of that out. And now, in the end of chapter 6, he starts to put it all back together. And I've been looking at this last, this final picture of the spiritual battle. What does it look like to be a spirit-filled Christian and to fight the spiritual battle? And so I think there are three things that he has for us this morning. I like my... uh, Oh, what's the what's the when you have the same letter at the same iteration. The, iteration alliteration uh, three e's uh, the, who is the enemy what's our equipment and how are we how are we meant to engage in the battle those three really key questions who who is the enemy what has God given us what's our equipment what have we been equipped with to fight the battle and lastly how are we actually meant to employ those that equipment. How are we meant to engage the enemy? And so Paul begins in verse 10 and he says, finally, lastly, closing statements, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You notice that he doesn't say, be strong in yourself. <laughs> or be strong physically or be strong emotionally or mentally. My wife and I went to watch, uh, finally got around to seeing the, the new Top Gun film. Has anybody seen that? That's a brilliant movie. I don't, I'm not sure my wife liked it as much as I did, but I sat there going, oh, that was really good. But it, Tom Cruise's character is, is, is a picture of what it looks like to be strong in yourself, self-assured, testing the limits of the plane, willing to risk. He's strong in himself. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty strength. Don't be strong in yourself. He repeats that at various places. He actually prays that for the believers in chapter 3. He says he prays that we would, we would be strengthened with power by, through his spirit in our inner being. Don't be strong in yourself. We live in a world this morning that says, Be strong in yourself. You be who you want to be. Define yourself. All of it comes from within. Paul says, no, No, it doesn't. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then he talks about our enemy. Who is our enemy? If you look in verse 11, he says, put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. And later on, he goes to talk, he calls him the evil one as well. Our enemy, he says, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other human beings. It's against a spiritual foe, the devil. He's called lots of different things in the New Testament. He's called the dragon, the deceiver, the accuser in Revelation chapter 12. He's called the tempter in Matthew chapter 4. He's called a murderer and a deceiver again and a liar in John chapter 8. A roaring lion looking for someone to devour. A deceptive angel of light in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Our foe is the devil and his forces. Paul calls them in verse 12. He says, the rulers, the authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil. I suspect that you guys who have been out in the street this last week have experienced that spiritual reality. Yes? Have you felt it? Yeah? I, on Thursday, I was out speaking to a young man who called himself a Christian, but all he wanted to talk about was the devil and demons, and I couldn't get him to talk about Jesus. It, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a present world. The spiritual world is a present reality. If you remember back in Ephesians chapter 1, The heavenly places is the phrase that Paul likes to use for that. He says that in chapter 1 and verse 3, we've been blessed by God and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly places. places. So the heavenly places are the location of all the spiritual blessings we have through what Jesus Christ did for us at the cross and through his resurrection. That's where all of the blessings are located in the spiritual realm. But it's also the place 
where the church in chapter 3 is, is announcing, we're announcing the mystery that, of Christ to the rulers and the authorities who are in the spiritual place, or in the heavenly realms. And it's also the place where the spiritual battle is. In, in our broad, secular, Western mindset, the spiritual doesn't matter. It doesn't count for anything. All that matters is what you see, hear, touch, feel, and taste. And Paul says, no, there's a spiritual reality. And there's a spiritual fight going on as well. And so we need to be really clear that our foe is the devil, the spiritual forces of evil, not other human beings. We can get into that mentality. It's us versus them. And yeah, 1 John says that that the, the world and its systems are under the power of the devil, but human beings are not our enemy. We need to be really clear on that, especially as we're out in the street talking to people, that we are for them. You said it earlier. Be friends with those who don't know Jesus. Our desire is to see them find freedom in Christ. Our enemy is the devil. And Paul says we need to think like soldiers. We need to think like soldiers. I was at an event uh, some time ago, and there's a picture in 2 Timothy chapter 2. And the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, you need to think like an athlete, think like a farmer, think like a soldier. And the person who was speaking said, happened to me with my dad said, stand up if you think you're a farmer. And most of the room stood up. And he said, stand up if you feel prime. We've all got a little bit of all three in us. He said, stand up if you feel like you're mostly an athlete in terms of your Christian life. And a few more people stood up. And he said, stand up if you think you're a soldier. And I'm not talking about, I, st- I stood up, you actually said soldier first. I stood up, I was the only one. And I'm not touting my own horn. It was just, we're planning a church, we're in Wolverhampton. I, I've just, I've felt, it's been a feeling I had for the last year, of just going, I'm, we're on the front lines. You guys felt it. Hope you guys, as we go out in the street and, and, and in the park next week, you're going to feel it as well. There's a sense of we're on the front lines, we're in enemy territory. But not enough of us see ourselves as fighting the spiritual fight. We're going to talk about what that looks like. And some of that is because in culture and in the church, we said, ah, you can't do that. No, it's right there. Paul says it. He says it again in 2 Timothy. We need to to get our heads around what it means to be soldiers for Jesus in a spiritual sense, fighting the good fight. We need to think like soldiers. And I think that means a couple of things. If you... Going back to that passage in 2 Timothy in chapter 2, Paul says, endure suffering like a good soldier. Thinking like soldiers means we're willing to follow our leader into difficult situations. We're willing to follow him to the death. He says in the next verse in 2 in Timothy, Timothy chapter 2, he says, good soldiers don't get mixed up in civilian affairs. We're people of integrity who love Jesus. We don't get mixed up in the things of the world. We'll talk about that more in a second. We're bold, strategic, risk takers, willing to lay down our lives for one another. And perhaps most importantly, we recognize the spiritual battle. I've shared a number of times that when I find out I'm preaching, two weeks ago I I preached on marriage, and guess what the Lord was working on me? You can ask my wife. We had a nice, happy fight at the beginning of the week, and the Lord was working on us and did some good work. Guess what I was fighting this week? Grumpy family, dreams, all kinds of stuff. My wife and I looked at each other this, on Tuesday and said, this is, this is a spiritual attack. This is, and I'm going, yep, I'm preaching on it this week. All right, Lord, it's about time. Yeah, we need to recognize the spiritual. When you encounter spiritual blindness at work, neighbors, you're trying to talk about Jesus, share your faith, and then it's like, why are they not getting it? I don't, they, they, they've got spiritual blinders on. It's a spiritual battle. When you encounter sin in your own life, in someone else's life, it's a spiritual battle. You ever have that, that, that where you, you're in a conversation, you're somewhere, even with 
your, your spouse or a close family member, and you're like, I, I should talk about Jesus right now. I should pray. And you feel like this physical resistance to like actually getting the words out. Anyone else ever feel that? Yeah. Spiritual battle. We got to recognize where the battle is actually at. Think like soldiers. There's two kinds of soldiers. Uh, we're going to talk about this in just a second. There's two kinds of soldiers. Two kinds of bad soldiers, if you will. There's the soldier who goes out into battle and leaves his gear in his tent. Bit of a nutcase. And there's the soldier who never actually gets onto the battlefield and looks at his stuff like, I could sell it off, I don't really need it. It's not essential. Because he never actually gets out there. Friends, we need to be the kind of soldiers who have our gear and use it and are out on the battlefield. Where are you this morning? Are, are you on the battlefield without your gear? Are you sitting in your tent going, ah, they're nice blessings. I don't really need them. You know, the new self that Paul talks about in Ephesians, righteousness, faith, truth. The word of God, eh, yeah, they're nice, eh? but I'm saved. I got my fire insurance. <laughs> or are you out there fighting the adventure? I was talking to David and Emma, and I said, exciting adventures this week. You guys, the Lord's been at work in your lives. Are you on an adventure with, with Jesus? Are you trusting him? Are you putting on what he's given you? Our enemy is the spiritual forces of evil. And our equipment in verses 14 through 17, uh, Paul gives us some details about this. This is fascinating stuff. Have you ever sat down and there's references to, to, to God putting on armor in Isaiah chapter 12 and 59, 11 and 59. There's other references in the New Testament to are the armor of light. And you can go, what, why does he call it a shield of faith? And the shoes, that's fascinating. We could spend all day right here. We're not going to. Don't worry. We've got good food to eat later on. We're going to take communion together as well. Um, but just a couple of thoughts for you from our equipment. The first thing that I think Paul wants us to understand is that the equipment is already in your possession. You have it. Yeah? You have everything you need. It's already in your tent. The challenge, and we're going to get to that in a minute, is to take it up and put it on. That's the verbs he uses. But it's already in our possession. If we just briefly look back through Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 8, the first element of the, of the, 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 the what's it called, armor of God is the belt of truth, the thing that holds everything else together. And if you remember back in chapter 1 and verses 8 and 9, it says that God has lavished the riches of his grace upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose that he set forth in Christ. We have truth. He says a few verses later that we were saved by, our, our, by trusting in the word of truth. We heard it and believed it. We have truth. Our spiritual blinders have been taken off. The breastplate of righteousness in chapter 4 and verse 24, he says that we're told to put on this new self. We have the new self, but we have to appropriate it. Put it on, the new self in verse 24, that has been created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Christ is our righteousness. We have it. He's done it. Truth, righteousness, the shoes, the shoes that are, how does he describe them in verse 15? The shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 14. It says that Jesus himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And then in verse 16, He's reconciled us to God. He's made peace. We have peace through the gospel. In all circumstances, he says, take up the shield of faith. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. 
For by grace you have been saved through what? And where does faith come from in the next sentence? This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Grace, faith, he gave them to us. We have it. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8 describes faith as very simply, we don't see him, but we trust him. We don't see him now, but we love him. It's loving and trusting Jesus, his faith. And the sword, God's self-revelation recorded in the scriptures. Paul hints at it in chapter 3 when he says, the mystery has been made known to me and I'm writing it down for you here. You can read it. We have everything that we need for life and godliness. It's in our possession. And so the challenge is, is what, this is why Paul says his command, put on the whole armor. Don't leave one piece behind. You need all of it. Put it on. Take it up. That's the challenge. And that's why I want to just camp out for a few minutes. Paul prays for truth, that we would know truth in chapter 1 and verse 17 and 18. He prays that we would have the spirit of wisdom, that our eyes would be opened. 1 Peter chapter 1 says, gird yourself. That's the language that Paul uses here with the belt of truth. He says, gird yourself. It's the picture of you've got a long, a long dress and you've got to hike it up, pull it and put it in your belt so you can run fast and be agile. Ladies, you've tried to run in long dresses. It's easier when you're wearing shorts, right? Okay. I don't, most of us men haven't run in long garments, so I'm, it's good to have a testimony. It's be prepared. And truth is central to that. Our eyes are open. We're ready. We're looking around, filled with the Spirit, seeing not truth as the world deals with truth, looking for conspiracies, looking for, for uh, who's... No, no, we see truth through the lens of the gospel, through Jesus. He is the basis of our truth, how we interpret the world, how we understand the nature of what's happening on through Jesus. So let me ask you this question. Where in your life are you tempted to deviate from truth? We're people of truth. Lies make us not ready. For the fight. They slow us down. They dull our senses. Where are you tempted to hide the truth? To tell a bold-faced lie? At work? To hide your faith? Amongst friends to be able to fit in? With family to smooth things over? Keep the peace? Where are you most tempted to deviate from truth? Paul says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. In chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. And then later on in verse 17, he says, Don't walk like the Gentiles who are still dead in their sins. That's the picture of righteousness. Walking in a manner which is worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Do you have guilt or fear or shame from things you've done in the past? Perhaps it's the far past. Perhaps it's the recent past that the devil keeps coming back to you and says, yeah, yeah. see, you're not worthy. Not worthy. Sinner. And you need to put on Christ's righteousness and say, devil, get out of here. Jesus forgave me. I've dealt with it. And he dealt with it. The picture of righteousness is really helpful in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We talked about it earlier. The, the soldier who doesn't get mixed up in civilian affairs. The picture is, is of, of a soldier who's meant to be going about his, his duties, what his commanding officers asked him to do, but he's so mixed up with the civilians that he hasn't got time or space left to do the things that he's called to do. A different picture is you, you, you're invited to a feast and you show up and you've already you filled up on junk food and you're not hungry for the feast anymore. Jesus doesn't tell us to stop sinning because he wants to spoil our fun. He, he, <laughs> he tells us to stop sinning because sin spoils our fun in him. Is there somewhere in your life that you are coming to the table already full? 
You're not experiencing the blessings of your salvation because you've filled up on sin. You're mixed up in civilian affairs. The shoes of the gospel. I need to move a little faster here. The shoes of the gospel. Christ made peace between humans as we relate to Jesus. We're at peace with one another from every tribe and nation. Jews and Gentiles is the language of Ephesians. But he made peace between us and God. And so the primary way, the shoes are about going, about moving towards someone, each other. Paul says, be eager to maintain the peace that you have in the unity of the Spirit. We move towards each other. Romans chapter 10 says, we have those who go and proclaim the message have, have what? They have beautiful feet. And so this picture of shoes is about relating to one another and relating to God. And we do that primarily through Jesus. We relate to one another as followers of Jesus through Jesus. And we relate to those who don't know him yet. We relate to them through Jesus as well. It's called evangelism and mission. And we relate to one another not on the basis of things we have in common. We're not a social club. But our unity is found only in Jesus. So two questions for that, for their shoes. Is your communion, your fellowship with other believers, is it rooted in Jesus primarily, or has it become rooted in things you have in common at a a human level? Well, God, it's rooted in Jesus. But if if you look at how we actually live, oftentimes, over time, we start to relate to each other by things we have in common. That's why cliques form in churches. And are you relating to, go back to my brother here who said, be friends with those who don't know, befriend those who don't know Jesus. We can relate to the world on its terms as well. Are you relating to the world around you through Jesus or on the world's terms, career? And we have to operate in it at some level. But career, in terms of family, in terms of marriage, in terms of life, or are you relating to it in terms of Jesus? which looks like proclaiming the gospel. We'll talk about about that in a minute. The helmet of salvation. Broke that up kind of weird. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 8, the Apostle Paul says, put on the helmet of the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation. We have this hope for the future. Our our, our eternal destiny is secure in the Lord Jesus. I, I never, I experienced this the most poignantly several years ago. And some of you know this story. But my wife and I, we, we lost a little girl at five days. And in the midst of the hurt and the pain and the suffering, in the midst of it, we have never been so certain of the hope of salvation. And my son, who was five at time six no five four five he's he's mr y and he wanted to know why where'd the baby go and my children now run around with i don't know how to describe they have a very concrete tangible sense that heaven is a place it's where grandpa is who can now run faster than tice it's where aveline who's our little girl is it's where other little ones that have that we've lost as well earlier in the process are those who know Jesus, we have the hope of salvation. Do you have that hope this morning? I know there are people in this room who have lost loved ones. I know that there are those of us who are going through difficult times and we look at the world and we see the brokenness and we have that hope that one day Jesus is coming back and he's going to set it right. Do you have the hope of salvation? Put that on. And the sword of the Spirit. Hebrews chapter 4 says that the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, it says that it's, it's, it's a powerful and effective tool. It's not, you get, get powerful but ineffective. And you can get effective but not powerful enough to get the job done. Does that make sense? 
The Word of God is both. Friends, we got to know it. We need to engage with it. We need to let it read us. Challenge for you this week. Pick a verse or a passage from Ephesians and commit it to memory. One verse, a couple of verses, passage you really like. One of Paul's prayers. Commit it to memory. Repeat it over to yourself in the car as you're driving, in the bus, as you're brushing your teeth in your head. Meditate on it. Commit it to memory. We're people of the word we fight with. You notice that that sword of the spirit is the only offensive, definitely offensive weapon that we have. That's the primary one. If we don't know our weapon, if I can put use that language, we're going to misuse it. We're going to mishandle it. If you've ever seen in, and I don't have a good movie reference, but you get the guy who just, just started to, to never held a sword before and the, the master comes up and just knocks it out of his hand. We need to, we need to master the weapon we've been given. It needs to infiltrate our speech, our language, our thinking, our hearts, and our minds. Memorization does that. Reading it regularly does that. It's powerful and effective. And lastly, just turn with me very quickly into Romans chapter 13. And then we'll talk about engagement. Romans chapter 13 and verse 12. Chapter 13 and verse 12. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The armor is a picture of Jesus. He says, put on the armor of light, and then he says, put on Jesus Christ. The armor that we've been given, that we're being told to put on, is, 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 is a picture of Jesus. Put on Jesus, is what he says. Friends, are you enjoying Jesus? Are you enjoying your relationship with him? Are you enjoying your salvation, taking hold of all the blessings through faith? Crisis comes up. You trust Jesus through it. You take hold of the things that he's given you. He strengthens you in your faith. You guys have been out in the street. You've lived this, right? You trusted him. You stepped out in righteousness, in truth, in faith, and he strengthened you through it. The armor is a picture of Jesus. We know who the enemy is. We know our equipment. How are we meant to employ our equipment? If you know a little bit about armor and weaponry, uh, you know that they're, they're different kinds of swords are meant to be used different ways. Different armor lends itself to different defensive postures. This armor lends itself to three kinds of engagement in particular that Paul lays out for us just briefly as we close. The first is prayer. He says in verse 18, praying at all times, all kinds of prayer, led, guided by the Holy Spirit. Remember, we're filled with the Spirit. That's the call. Different kinds of prayer. With our eyes wide open, persevering in prayer. Do you find prayer hard work? Let's be honest. You get bored during prayer. You find you have to persevere in it. We're going to pray together on Tuesday evening. We pray together on Sunday mornings. We believe that prayer is the first work of the believer, in part from this passage. We've been given armor, and the first thing that Paul says in terms of how we engage is through prayer. So we pray together. But we pray as individuals as well. We talked about this on Thursday. When we're in the streets, guys will talk about this when we're in, in, the, in, in the park as well and we go into the streets next week, is that there's got to be a running conversation with, between you and the Lord Jesus as you're talking, as you're listening to someone going, Lord, what am I hearing? I don't understand. How do I respond to this? You're in crisis at work and the first thing you do is what? Is that what you actually do? It's not what I actually, well, sometimes. This is our first, this is the first thing. Paul could say anything. Pray. It's not a waste of time. 
sometimes we like to dumb down prayer and say, well, it's just about get us getting on God's timetable. Well, it is. It's about us seeking him. But I have to, I can't read scripture without going somehow in the mystery of how God has chosen to work. He actually does respond to his people in prayer. And he answers when we ask for stuff. In Jesus' name. Are you asking him for stuff that only he can do? Are you asking for stuff that you could do? Stuff that he's asked you to do? And we need to ask for strength as well, but you ought to be asking God for some stuff that only he can do. We pray. I do notice that Paul says, pray for me. Specifically in his proclamation of the gospel. He says, pray. So we pray for the work of the gospel, but we also need to be involved in gospel work, proclaiming evangelism and mission. And Paul is our example in that. Paul is chained to a Roman citizen as he wrote the book of Ephesians. And yet he is engaged in. In chapter 1 and verses 17 through the end of the chapter, chapter 3, he's engaged in big, meaty prayers, warlike prayers for the people of God. To be filled with strength. To have the spirit of wisdom. And yet he's, he's chained to a Roman soldier. He's a physical captive, and yet he's fighting the spiritual battle through prayer. As he proclaims the gospel to the guards, people who come to him, and at the end of the book of Acts, Many people came to him and he preached the gospel to them. Paul is our example of what it looks like to fight the spiritual battle in the right way. And lastly, we did this this morning. He says, I'm going to send Tychicus to you so that your hearts will be encouraged. You've been praying for me. I want you to know how I'm doing and, and, and I want your hearts to be encouraged. We, on a semi-regular basis, we do have opportunity to share testimony. We do it one-to-one in smaller groups as well. But you should know this. When you share a testimony about what God has done in your life, you are fighting the spiritual battle. You're encouraging others' hearts. You're witnessing about how God has worked in your life. Keep telling each other how the Lord is working in your life. I want to close with this, just a simple challenge. David is a wonderful example of what it looks like to be a warrior as well. We didn't talk about him this morning. But in 2 Samuel chapter 11, and those of you who know your Bibles know where we're going, David decides to stay home from war at the time when the kings normally went out to battle. And he stayed home. And he took off his armor. And what happened? Sin happened. Disciples don't take breaks. We don't take vacations from Jesus. And so my challenge to you this morning is be strong in the Lord. Put on his armor. We've got good work to do. You guys have been in the streets. Was it good? It was good work? Amen. Friends from Crossover Church, just getting to know you guys. We've got good work to do. And in your home churches, there's good work to do. And it's a spiritual battle as well. Let's pray as, and then we'll close in song. Father, I thank you for your word to us this morning. Lord, I know that temptation of, of, of wanting to take a, a vacation, even if it's just an hour. Ah, I could stop. I could stop. I put my disciple hat over here and take my armor off just for a second. I just need to, I just need to relax for a second. I know that temptation, Lord. I've succumbed to it. Father, I pray that you would strengthen each person here by the power of your spirit in their inner being this morning that we wouldn't get caught up in looking at, 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 the, at the other, all the things that, that the world places that the devil tempts around us, but that we would know the height and the depth and the width of your love, the greatness of it, that it's better than anything this world could offer. And that you would strengthen us in that way. Strengthen us for the fight. Strengthen us for the battles that are ahead. 
Thank you that we don't fight for victory, but we fight from victory. We don't fight with a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Lord, as those go home and and others are just arriving and, 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 Father, we're the local church here, I pray that you would be glorified in the words of our mouths, the thoughts of our hearts, our actions this next week. That you would give us eyes to see where the battle is at. It's in your name I pray. Amen.